system than first past the post. What you get with first past the post, very simply, I keep on saying it, the person with the most votes wins. Every vote counts equally. And this is important, because when you go and vote, if you vote for the BNP, and the BNP comes fifth, I don't mind that being a dead vote. It shouldn't go any further. You've had your choice. You've made it. Why should you get another go when I have gone out and voted, say, radically, I voted Lib Dem? <laughs> <laughs> why should I then be given... Oh, I you, you know, why, why should I then be given no second bite at the cherry when the person who's voted for the extremist starts? And we have a lot of talk about how I would moderate politics and so on and so forth. It might, but on the other hand, it might make it more extreme. It might make politicians pander to the most unpleasant elements of the extreme wings. Now, the other thing we've heard is that it's going to root out corruption. The Deputy Prime Minister himself has said we couldn't have the expenses scandal and all of that if we'd had AB. Well, you may know there are three countries in the world that have AB. There's Australia, there's Papua New Guinea, and there's Fiji. And I don't imagine many of you have considered how elections go in Papua New Guinea. But I have. I thought I would look at what happened at the elections in Papua New Guinea in 2007. There are about 120 constituencies in Papua New Guinea. After the election, 53 of those were investigated for fraud, voter intimidation, corruption, and general malfeasance. So the idea that this is going to clear up your dear stables of British politics is very old nonsense. But I thought we'd go to Australia, a country that, like us, uh, has our sovereigns as queen, which is a matter they take particular delight in. Um, one of the, I've said this back to you, that's absolutely right. Um, now, one of the things we're told is that it'll get rid of Yahoo politics. The Australians and Yahoo politics could teach us a thing or two, and I thought it might be worth quoting uh, the leader of the opposition in Australia in the House of Commons. So not in a debate outside, but with all the formality of the House of Commons. He said... Um, to the Prime Minister, what a fraud, what a phony, what a complete fake the Prime Minister is. Even Edward Miliband doesn't go for that sort of phraseology. Another uh, Australian, well, I think this is a rather good phrase, I'll see if I can get it in Hansard. Uh, as much as the Shadow Treasurer's plan, the, the, sorry, there's as much meat in the Shadow Treasurer's plan as in a pack of chicken nuggets. Well, there you go. You've got rid of Punch and Judy, you've got rid of frivolity, you've just got a pack of chicken nuggets. It seems to me that sums up AB. It's a pack of chicken nuggets. There's no meat on it. Get rid of it. Stick to the system where the person with the most votes wins. It's fair, it works, it's right. Um, this is the point where I'm going to open it up to the audience to ask any questions they may have. Um, we do have two people running around microphones, so um, if I still want to let you, just wait for my friend to come to you and um, then ask a question. So I'll start with the guy. Um, I don't know, the guy with the uh, navy blue top on. <laughs> <laughs> A government can only exist with 50% or more of members of the House of Commons. The confidence of 50% or more of the House of Commons legislation can only pass with 50% or more of the support of the House of Commons. Does it not upset the MPs on the panel that members that they sit next to don't enjoy the support and confidence of more than 50% of their constituencies? Mr. Reesmog, for example, in 2010, 59% of the people in North East Somerset voted actively against you. Does this not? Does this not make you feel a little bit uneasy when you stand up and speak for them? Um, well, I'm, going to, I'm going to take a, sort of a bunch of questions, so I'll take two more questions for the yeah. first, and then um, they can be answered um, directly necessary. So I'll take a man for the structure. Um, I think, in a nutshell, um, the, the, in a nutshell, the 
argument in favour of the alternative vote is that it produces the least unacceptable member or candidate, the least unacceptable outcome in any individual constituency. And to me, that seems to be far fairer than something which I have an example here of a seat in the New South Wales state election which was held Saturday fortnight ago um, without naming parties at all. One candidate got 32.6% of the vote, one candidate got 30.7% of the vote, another candidate got 302 with the remaining votes spread over five or six further candidates. Now, if any person can persuade me that being elected on 32.6% of the vote, less than one third is fair for anybody, then I'm willing to be persuaded that I find it very difficult to accept. I mean, on preferences, it was a person 30.7 that got in, but that was a person who ultimately was the least unpreferred okay, by you. all the voters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take the motion. Uh, Just start by saying that the, um, the, the point about MPs getting 50% share of the vote, I think it's really, really important point that you raise. And although, as it happens, I did get more than 50% of the vote, there were still people in Bath who were voting tactically to stop somebody getting in. And so I don't know what would have happened in Bath if we'd have had AV. And I don't know whether I would have got in that position or not. So that would be an interesting thing to say. And of course, one of the things that won't have helped me uh, next time round is what I did over university tuition fees. And as some of you, and not many, I think, just looking around the room, were here for that meeting, uh, where I explained what had happened, um, would particularly acknowledge that I was very upfront about what I did. And I don't want to go through all of the details of it now, but very quickly, the one thing that I think would inevitably happen if we had AV, is you would never again see politicians doing what I did, was making <laughs> solemn pledges, then finding you get yourself unable to put them in practice because you're in coalition with another party for the sake of the country which we had to do, and therefore having to compromise, as both the Conservatives have had to do and Liberal Democrats have had to do, and in the case of the tuition fees, I think what we were at least able to do was to take a system which, had it carried on under a conservative, pure conservative government, would not have been as fair as it currently is. A system where at least 40% of students who are part-timers who previously were not out are now out, where everybody starts paying back at a higher rate, where people who are on lower incomes after graduating pay less than they currently do, and where everybody, regardless of the salary after graduating, actually pays back less per month than they currently do, which makes it easier to get mortgages. But that still in no way is saying I did not break a pledge that I made, something I found enormously difficult to do, and I think if we move to AV, then I think, and anyway, frankly, I think people are going to be much more cautious in the language that they use, putting in appropriate caveats with only if we form a Liberal Democrat government on our own. But I, I accept the criticism that's implied in the question. Uh, thank you, John. Um, uh, possibly to take it where you can answer the question of um, uh, how first off first allows um, a situation where someone would have three candidates. I'm going to try and answer all three of them. The gentleman at the back is absolutely right, and the problem you have if you have more coalitions is that encouragement.